Hey everybody, welcome to Matt Men, your source for all things professional wrestling. We have a very special show today. Of course, I'm joined by Rich Stamboli, my co-host. Hello. Hello, Rich. Hello. Love the shirt. Thank you. We're all in, in black today. Just like a cult, a beautiful <laughs> cult. <laughs> <laughs> We're joined by the one, the only. Uh, listen, this is awesome for me. I'm very excited for this. Mm. Billy Corgan from the NWA Wrestling, obviously. Uh, the Smashing Pumpkins. Uh, the, the soundtrack to my youth. I guess. I think everybody's youth in our in our yeah. Yeah. Why What's not? going on, Billy? Well, it's my birthday. So Happy um, birthday. Happy birthday. It's uh it's it's a sign of my insanity that I'm working on my birthday. <laughs> and, uh, so um wrestling, my birthday, and I figure this probably my ten thousandth interview in life. So maybe it's a it's a coming together of all the forces. You know, do you ever get tired of doing these interviews? You know, I never get tired of talking about wrestling. Um, I think with music, after so many years, it sort of kind of grinds you into a certain pattern. It's not a bad pattern because, um, you know, it usually starts off with like, oh, you're a legend, dot, 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 and gets into a lot of stuff that I guess they ascribe to you being a legend for. Um, wrestling, at least to me, feels like a fresher opportunity where in my musical life, there's a lot of set narratives and there's only so much I can do in, within those narratives, you know. Um, uh, I don't mind being the bad guy in, in music, but it gets a bit old after a while. Um, like I got little kids and, you know, at some point it's like I'm not I'm not the guy you wish I was, the, the, the goth guy living in his basement. But I, I realize that helps you sell some clicks. So um, I, I just find a re wrestling a, a fresher opportunity as far as a public public part. It has to be. Oh, by the way, we're here to talk about NWA 312, April 7th. Hey, we say 312. 312, know, like... the area code. Yes, the yeah, area yeah, code, yeah, 312. Yeah. Even though we're going to – actually, we're wrestling in the 847, so it's a bit confusing. But <laughs> we, we, we felt everyone would at least know what 312 was. It's going to be uh, live in Highland Park, Illinois. It's going to air on Fight, obviously. We'll give you guys a link in our, in our uh, notes here. Also, television taping is scheduled for April 8th. You can buy tickets at NWA Tix. That's T I X dot com. Also, the proceeds, part of the proceeds, um, will go to the Highland Park Community Fund, which I want to talk to Billy about. Billy, you know, th there's th there's so many different things I want to ask you, but uh, and I'm sure you've been asked this, but you know, for me, that was one moment in professional wrestling. I was like, you know, I absolutely love this. Like, this is something I absolutely love. What was that for you? What was the moment that that you know, what was the match? What was what were you watching that that you thought to yourself, I this is something I, I really it, it it turned something on for me and it and it's something I absolutely love. You know, I, I grew up watching wrestling as a kid in Chicago and you know, I have a lot of memories there, but it, I never thought I would end up working on the professional business part of the <laughs> the equation. I think for me that magical moment was probably going to an ECW show about nineteen ninety nine. I walked backstage. Um, I'd, I'd been invited to go to a show. And I walked backstage, and as soon as I got there, I looked over there, and there's Sandman, there's Tommy Dreamer. Uh, I asked to go to the washroom. I go in, there's Raven doing his makeup. It's like I found myself sort of in this crowd of people who many of I know personally and work with to this day, Bully being one of them. And I felt like I sort of belonged, but I can't explain to you why I belonged. It was a similar feeling I got when I walked into clubs playing in a band. Walking into that ECW atmosphere, I felt like I belonged somehow. Like the things I was in the world sort of belonged in that weird world, even though I had no context for it at the time. Now, first of all, happy birthday, Billy. Thank you. Uh, is, this, this is the only day of the year that you want to go by Patrick? Since it's also St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> is that, is that, is that, is, yeah. You know, I tried that in high school. I got yeah. sick of my name. Everybody called me Bill. So I tried Patrick in high school and it never mm -hmm. flew. So um, you're the first person to bring it up, I think, in about 30 years. But go on then. <laughs> <laughs> They're all, all my questions are Patrick-related questions. Um, so that that was the moment, you know, like you said, being in that ECW locker room. Was that... Was that the time where you were like, I want in, I, I want to, I, I'm a musician, but no. I want in on this business. I want in no. on the wrestling business. Okay. No, when was not that? at all. Not at all. I just felt like I sort of belonged. And then okay. them being carnies, you know, they immediately got me into an angle and had me appear at a show and mm -hmm. I get it. It was, and it was good fun, you know? And like I said, now that I know, you know, Tommy and Bully and Lou D'Angeli for 20 something years now, 
it makes sense. Like our relationships endured. My being welcomed into the world of ECW stuck. Like it's still part of me, you know. Yeah. Um, and then after that, I would go to like, you know, TNA shows down in Nashville when the Jarrett's were running, you know, the, the weekly pay-per-view model and stuff like that. And, you know, like people like Jerry Lynn and Just Incredible were wrestling there. So then I got to meet other people that were in TNA, whether it was James Storm or whoever, you know. And that, you know, eventually one day led to me working for TNA. So there was no magical moment. But if you said pick one moment where you thought, OK, you sort of belong in this world. But no, I'm the look, wrestling as a business is a really messy business. I mean, you guys talk about it probably more than anybody. It's a really messy business. It, it's not run, let's say, as proper as it should be. And it's not run equal to a lot of other uh, businesses in entertainment. Um, I'm not trying to say I'm the person who's going to change that, but I'm at least trying to update it into the 21st century. And I think combined with my passion, my love for professional wrestling, my relationships, I've been able to do some of that. And I think you see those changes coming with the, you know, the bigger companies that are out there. Um, so it's a mixed bag, you know what I mean? Like I, it's, it's like, I feel the same way about rock and roll. Like I love rock and roll, but it's a really messed up business. And even though I've been very successful in it, I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's all, you know, wine and roses because it's not even close to that. What would you change about the professional wrestling business? I mean, coming from entertainment, uh, you know, on a mega scale, uh, I mean, let's be honest, uh, you had one of the most successful rock bands of the of the decade of, of all time for rock and roll. Uh, what what are those uh, changes that you would see? I mean, I guess seeing it from the entertainment side to the professional wrestling side. Well, not to correct you, we're still one of the most successful bands in the of world. Of course you are. So yeah, of course. Uh, no, because it's important for people to understand, because sometimes, you know, the way this culture works, if they think you're from an era, that's what they think you're from. And I've been lucky enough to endure on the musical side at the highest levels for over 30 years. And the reason I bring that up and even cut my own little promo on that is to say, look, I understand what success feels like, not only in a, in a decade, but in, in multiple decades. So I've watched the professional wrestling business sort of, you know, uh, kick its feet in the dirt over changes over, say, the last 20 years. I think the most important thing that I would point to, number one, is mental health. Uh, the business is set up very much like the music business, where there's a lot of insecurity. Uh, and there's financial reasons for that. And there's cultural reasons for that. I'm talking about wrestling cultural reasons for that. But the level of mental health, uh, the, the, the mental health of your particular talents is far more valuable than I think companies in the past would have thought. And I think in 2023, we have to be much more conscious of that um, because we want to present to the public, particularly uh, for young children, stuff like that. We want them to understand, like, look, this is a this is meant to be it's dangerous, but it's meant to be safe. It's meant to be provocative, but it's not supposed to be uh, dark to the point where, you know, it's a sad it's a sad ending at the end of the day. Like like I like to say, no, nobody wants to see our heroes in wheelchairs and stuff like that. So I think I think mental health and then into physical health, the long term health of the professional wrestlers themselves. Um, you know, I know people have talked about health insurance and there's financial reasons there and the independent contractor status. I mean, anybody who's a kind of even somewhat casual wrestling fan sort of understands those dynamics. But I'm saying at the granular level, level the mental and physical health of the, of the roster, I think, is, is really important. And those those updates, particularly in the last few years, I think are very valuable. Now, that's that's a fascinating point that you bring up. Like, I don't think we've ever heard that before from a promoter or anybody, you know, especially about the, the mental health aspect. Now, I kind of want to tie that into to something else here where how has has being on tour your entire adult life helped you in that regard with talent relations? You know, like you said, the music industry isn't all wine and roses. I assume the wrestling industry is not all wine and roses either. Yeah, I think I have a very unique position, you know, I mean, look, when you come into the professional wrestling business and you're not a talent yourself, meaning a wrestling talent, you know, you quickly understand the distinction between like the boys and office or whatever, right? Okay. I've heard all those things through the years. I've had wrestling writers make fun of me as like some sort of mark that wanders around with the checkbook in my hand. The fact of the matter is, is as a talent myself for, you know, 35 going on 40 years, um, I'm very... I can really tell the signs of when people are struggling. I can really tell when their own sort of inner demons or their insecurities are getting to them. And I would look to uh, some of the roster that's on the NWA. Tom Latimer, for example, who I've worked with for years, going back to TNA and now 
a member of the NWA roster. Tom's been very public about his struggles, uh, his issues with uh, uh, drink and drugs and stuff like that. Getting him to, into a stable environment where he can bring his best self to work and feel that he's uh, protected, supported, and we have his best interests at heart has been very valuable to someone like Tom as a human being. And by putting Tom Latimer, the human being first above Tom Latimer, the performer, well, then we get to see the best of Tom Latimer, the performer. So that's a that's an example I would point to. But like I said, having been on tour all those years, I can see the warning signs. I can I can I can I I find myself pulling certain talents aside and saying, look, yeah, we're here to work. But if you need help or you need to talk to somebody or you want to have a conversation outside the bounds of being in this company, feel free. We can always talk. And, and you'd be surprised how many people take me up on those conversations, because just the fact that somebody cares and says to them that who they are in life is more important than the, who they are in a wrestling ring can be very valuable. And let me tell you, I've been in that situation a thousand times. And most of the times people reinforce that my only value to them in music was whether or not I could sell records or tickets and that my own mental health wasn't that valuable to them and they didn't really care. It was kind of like, that's your problem. And I, I think we need to evolve past that. Has that gotten better uh, in the music scene? Uh, are, are, I guess, management and, and the labels more conscious of that, of the talent? Yes. Um, uh, you know, there, there's an organization that started a few years back called Music Cares, where they go out of their way to make sure people can go to rehab if they need to go to. There's kind of a fund set up and there's fundraisers every year and a lot of the top stars come and play. I've even played one of the benefits myself. Um, I think people have started to really realize that mental health in the entertainment business is a much more important component, not only to success, but longevity than anybody would have imagined. I think being able to come out of the shadows on the entertainment side, so I guess I'm talking generally about music, but you can talk about wrestling, people being able to come out and say, this is who I am, this is what I've struggled with, and be able to talk about that on the public side and not be punished for it on the professional side, I think that's a real evolution recently. Yeah, that, that's fantastic to hear um, because you hear all the bad stories and, and you rarely hear the positives of, you know, who's doing what to kind of change that uh, that negative narrative with with entertainment, but with pro wrestling, too. You know, now, now I mean, you're you own the NWA, you're, you're a professional wrestling promoter. Uh, you know, sometimes life takes you down paths uh, that that you don't you never saw happening. Uh, I always say, like, this is something from my childhood that I was never able to let go, and that's why I, you know, I'm, I'm doing this. I talk about it. When you decided to, you know, purchase the NWA, was that a difficult decision for you to make, or was it just, okay, this is something I really want to do, and I'm going to move forward with it? You know, I, I was, I tried to buy TNA, and that turned into a whole huge lawsuit, which was very public, and, you know, everybody's friends now, but at the time, it was very acrimonious, and I thought I was done with professional wrestling after that because, you know, as I said quite publicly, you know, the forces at play at that particular time tried to steal millions of dollars from me. It left a pretty bitter taste in my mouth, particularly people I would have considered at the time friends. Um, you know, so when the opportunity came up to buy the NWA, I was like, mm, I don't know if I really want to get back in the professional wrestling business, but I, I, I found it impossible to pass up the opportunity to own such an important an August brand. And of course, people, you know, they, they chided me for buying three worthless letters and stuff like that. And then when the NWA didn't come back and I didn't blow, you know, $50 million out the gate and it wasn't sort of, it wasn't dusty and iron and, and Magnum all over again, I, then suddenly I was supposed to live up to a legacy that was 30 years before and was in a different set of economics. And by the way, it was before McMahon took over the whole business and changed the game forever. So I've had to go through all that. And there's been different times, particularly during the pandemic, where I really questioned my sanity. But by and large, brick by brick, I've been able to build something sort of like, um, I don't want to say in my image, but like in the image of what I want a professional wrestling company to be. And that's what I say behind the scenes. Like if we're going to succeed, we're going to succeed the right way. And we're going to do it this way. And if it works great, and if it doesn't, well, then it just doesn't work. It sets a different tone in the company. Um, that success is important, but it's not success at all costs. Um, and obviously we've talked about mental and physical health. That's part of it. You have to demonstrate that. Um, I can't tell you how many times the wrestlers come to me on a taping day or something and say, hey man, I'm really banged up. And I'll say, you know what, don't worry about it. I'll protect you. I'll move the book in around and we'll take care of it. Just the look on their face that like, you're not gonna make me go out there and kill myself for, for, for some TV segment. 
Um, I can't speak to their other experiences in the thing, but that's the way we try to run the NWA. And of course, people pull me aside sometimes and say, how do you know you're not being worked? And how do you, and I say, okay, well, then I, I got I to gotta live with that. I got to live with myself. In essence, I want to create a really positive 21st century NWA that has the opportunity to run at the highest levels. And remember, when you talk to network executives, people that run some of the biggest networks in the world, both broadcast and digital, they're very concerned with how uh, people are portrayed in the 21st century, whether they're from a different background, whether they're, uh, you know, whether whatever their sexual interest is, their genders, whatever. It's a very complicated world like that. But the point being is they want to make sure that wrestling is moving in in accord with the rest of the culture. And so presenting a positive image that's very inclusive, not woke, because I'm not the biggest fan of all that stuff, but basically like, look, this is who we are. We, we represent everything equally. We want everybody to have a fair opportunity, no matter where they come from, no matter who they love. I think we represent that every day that we run the company. And then that becomes something that people are comfortable to talk about being in business with because they too have heard all the stories about wrestling in the 20th century going into the 21st. And, and whether or not I want to live up to that, I'm held up to that because of the stories that people have heard. And of course, everybody's watched Dark Side of the Ring and all that stuff too. So if you inherit that, fine, but you also have to be part of the change on that. Now, <clears throat> it strikes me as, you know, like it, just talking to you for the last 10 minutes that you strike me as like a, this is an honest guy who loves professional wrestling and taking into account everything that you just said about the business, about being a promoter and all the extra uh, stuff on top of it. You know, a lot of folks don't really know what exactly goes into running something of that magnitude. What has been your favorite moment as a promoter, small or large, or even as a person, just being able to run and own NWA and interacting with the people that you do on a daily basis? Sure. Well, you know, there's the there's the personal end of the relationships. You don't make a lot of friends in the professional wrestling business, but I have made some. But setting that aside, I think my 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 greatest thrill is giving people the opportunity to perform at the highest level. And we've had a lot of people come through the door that have either been overlooked by the wrestling business, have been told they have no upside in the wrestling business, or they've been discarded by a major company and said, okay, you know, your, your run's basically over. And helping them in, you know, in, in sort of like a partnership find value in a new character, in a new approach, you know, with a new audience, with a different set of opportunities, that's really a, a, a great thrill because... Um, you know, sometimes we call the NWA the land of lost toys because we have people come in that have been told, hey, you know, your best days are behind you. I've certainly had that happen to me in the in the music business, and I proved everybody wrong 100 times over. So I'm very sensitive to that, of what it feels like to be told, OK, you're done and then be given another chance. And I think there's why there's a certain sort of level of loyalty and fidelity um, to what we're trying to do at the NWA. Uh, one thing that I was really encouraged by yesterday was, you know, we just saw that Taya Valkyrie uh, got signed to AEW. Uh, first of all, working with Taya was a complete joy. One of the best uh, professional wrestlers, not just female, best professional wrestlers I've ever worked with. Total professional on every level. Uh, I can't say enough good things about her. But the fact that she went out of her way to thank us yesterday, uh, myself included, uh, on her way to AEW. And, of course, we wish her the best in that. Um, you know, that's that's part of why we do what we do. It's 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 because we are invested in the people. And I think you see over time, it's taken some time that people are loyal to what we're trying to accomplish because they recognize it's something a little bit unique in a, in a wrestling business that has a lot of commonality in it. You know, I, just looking at the card uh, and touching on something, it's a very diverse cra uh, card. It's a very diverse, uh, you know, wrestling roster of talent you know from ec3 to scion to tyrus uh you know uh, chris adonis you you know some of that is re it's it's interesting to watch the product because i've been watching since you started and i and i have to say i i love the visuals of it i love the old school feel of the studio show but it's still modern it, it feels modern it doesn't feel like a nostalgic it just feels like it's supposed to look like this when i when i think of the nwa and what i'm watching and, but the wrestling is also, to me, it, it caters exactly what I love about professional wrestling. It is, you know, the traditionalism meeting the new the new style. Um, do, is that something that you're conscious of when you're putting the card together that you you want uh, to the the prestige of the legacy of the NWA represented in your product on top of you know modernizing? 
Um, that's difficult because, you know, most people that you're trying to attract, young people, don't really care about history. Um, you know, even with the Smashing Pumpkins, when we when we make new fans, people automatically assume, oh, they're a fan of Siamese Dream or something. And then you talk to them and you realize, they're, no, they're actually a fan of the new music that you're making. People want to have their experiences in their time. And although they appreciate and respect history, by and large, um, they want history made in their time, right? Like we started this off by talking about me walking into ECW locker room circa 1999. Of course, we know everything that happened after that with ECW, but that ECW will forever be in my heart, right? We want to make those same memories for, for young people now. So I think you, what you're trying to do is you're trying to find the respectful balance of what NWA historically represents, which if you remember was, was an affiliation of a lot of different promotions. So the best place the NWA really works is like what we just did in Mexico City in front of 30,000 fans at this music festival that I ran called The World is a Vampire, where we work with AAA. Creating opportunities, creating uh, relationships with other companies and creating kind of dream supercards and stuff like that. I think that's what we can bring to the table in the 21st century is the, is the historical aspect of the NWA. But that said, you know, as much as I love me some Tyrus and some Chris Adonis, right? And as much as I love me some, uh, you know, La Rebellion versus, you know, uh, you know, uh, in in uh, in uh, Mexico City, it was a Blue Demon Junior and Vampiro. As much as I love that, I love even more that it's about Camille and La Rosa Negra and Carrie Morton and you know Joe Alonzo. I love that we're bringing in this young generation, and in all in in, in the cases of the young people, these are people that are offered opportunities, but the NWA they've chosen gives them the best opportunity to show the world they're a world-class athlete. And so that's the balance that I'm after. Does that make sense? It's like, yes, it's all good, and I love me some veterans, but at the end of the day, the NWA will rise with the young people because we have to attract a younger crowd and a younger demo um, than even maybe some of the other bigger companies. I imagine that there is, there's got to be a crossover between NWA fans and I, 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 I want to say like, I want to say pumpkins fans but i want to say like billy corgan's fans because you've had a million projects no, you know like no really no, no wow, crossover. Really? Me, i wish <laughs> i wish in fact it's my birthday wish i wish more of my fans <laughs> my musical fans uh were willing to give the nwa a chance what's wow. been nice no <laughs> what's been nice about it is when the fans do give it a chance mm -hmm. they almost always come back and say i'm either now a wrestling fan <laughs> or I'm not a wrestling fan, but I really enjoy what you're doing and I can understand why you do it. So I respect it now where before I just thought it was this kind of strange thing. You were that doing. was my wife last night. Huh. My, my wife and I, Billy, honestly, last night we, we, we just, you know, I had a glass of wine and all of a sudden I put on some of your music and then I was, and I was you know, introducing her to the NWA and the she, <laughs> she, we got into it. We watched like two episodes of NWA Power. Uh, one was NWA USA and the other one was Power. We just went through it. I was like, it's so easy to watch it. Yeah, uh, and it's fun, man. It, you know, it, it's it's professional wrestling. It's exactly what I've I grew up with, uh, and mm -hmm. and you know the you could tell your influence also in the presentation. I absolutely love it, and it was it was great. You know, last night, and it was an introduction to her, and she's like, you know what, I would watch this. This came to New York. I want to go. You know, it's a yeah. it's it's intimate. It's an it, yeah. it feels like you're there when you're watching it, which uh, you know, just my honest opinion of it. Yeah, sorry to interrupt you. I, I think I think the difficulty for um you know, uh, I've used this term before, but, you know, I call it in the bubble. So I would say that us talking today, we're in the bubble, right? We're, we're paying attention to who's signing where and, you know, the backstory on why somebody was pulled off a of raw and all that stuff. That's in the bubble. But the fact of the matter is, is most of America and most of the world is not in the bubble. And the traditional audience for professional wrestling up until really about 10 years ago was the biggest mainstream crowd you would, could attract from grandma to a little kid. And wrestling in the last 10 years has gotten away from that. Uh, and there's various reasons why, and some of them are positive. I firmly believe that the future of professional wrestling moves it back to a, a mainstream position and, is, and its appeal is to the broadest audience. That's the wrestling I grew up on. That's the wrestling that historically has hit the highest levels. When people talk about the Attitude Era, they have to understand that that was, everybody was watching. That demo was massive up and down the scale. It wasn't just guys like us wearing black, you know what I mean? Talking about Roman Reigns versus, you know, you know, Andre, you know, who's a better champion, whatever that those great arguments that people have in bars. You know, I think a lot of it was the the time, you know, the that 
I the Howard Stern <laughs> Extreme Sports MTV. It was in yeah. your face. Everything was connected. Uh, Free streaming too. Huh? Free streaming too. Free streaming. Yeah. Everything was connected, and it was so it was refreshing. It wasn't traditional. You know, the music scene wasn't the traditional music that you imagine. We came out of the hair band era. We went into grunge. It was so it was raw. Everything felt, uh, for lack of a better term, it was it was raw. But let me let me say, I still uh, and uh, you know. Quote me on this in 10 years. I think wrestling's biggest days are still ahead. I agree with you. Yeah. As big as the NWA was, Vince made it bigger, right? And then people look at that and say, wow, that was massive. And yes, of course, <laughs> WWE's massive. But 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 compared to UFC, compared to the NWA, there's still room for growth. That's why people are out looking at the WWE on the open market for sale, because people realize there's growth to go. Yeah. And, nope, when, 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 and when, you uh, wouldn't be investing in, in a professional rest, in the professional wrestling business if you felt that it was flatlined. You know, that's another aspect of it. Well, it you was see flat when I bought there. five years ago. And, and now I get business people sending me stuff all the time saying they can't believe some of these earnings reports they see from WWE. And I, <laughs> I always write them back. See, I told you I'm not insane. It's not this is just not some weird, kind of weird hobby. There's a growth vector here. So I would say to people in the bubble, which I, I'm including everybody in here in the conversation, is is stay focused on the fact that wrestling's best days as a business, if you love the business or you love the performers, the best days are ahead of them. And you see tension there with, with, with brand, right? Like the story with, uh, you know, Sasha, you know, leaving WWE and being on the Mandalorian. I mean, you see the rise of individual brands. Brock Lesnar, of course, left, went to UFC, became a bigger brand, and he raised his value and, and works a part-time schedule for Vince where 20 years ago they wouldn't have allowed that. Those are small signs of what's coming, which is, and that includes Jake Paul coming in and stuff like that, uh, or Bad Bunny. The opportunity of wrestling to grow to an even bigger global platform and a larger global audience um, is, is unprecedented. And digital is very much a part of that. Social media is a part of that. So stay focused on that. Why you want to get into every little turf conversation, or you don't understand why Billy's over here in the corner doing what he's doing, understand that my personal faith and my investment in it is I believe that the NWA can rise up to, to a level that is even greater than the NWA before. Now, if you look at what I'm doing now, you're going to say he's totally insane. But that's what they said about my band and, and my musical life. And here I am, you know, 35 years later, still going. So that's that's how I feel about it. Um, and I think there's plenty of empirical data to suggest that everything is still trending upwards. Let's talk about this card a little bit, Billy. Uh, I'm excited for it. NWA 312, April 7th, a few weeks away, three weeks away from Chicago, Highland Park, Illinois, Highland Park, Illinois. I don't want to, I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to make the mistake and say Chicago. <laughs> well, uh, you know what? No, you didn't because, because honestly, we say Chicago, even though we live in Highland Park, it's okay. hard to explain. It's like, it's like <laughs> you live in the suburbs, but you still say Chicago. So you're, you're, you're in the realm of, but you're okay for us. That's me. Know. I'm in Queens. We live in Bayside, Queens, but I'm in New York. Yeah, City. right. You say New York, right? Yeah. 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 I say Queen. I, I never say I live in Bay. I, I live in New York City. Uh, let's talk about this card. What are you most excited for? I mean, it's a jam-packed card. Gr great matches. Great talent on there. Uh, obviously, I'm going to order it, uh, as I do whenever you run a show. Uh, what, what What's the most exciting uh, thing for you on the card? Um, I think La Rosa Negra and Camille, I'm very excited to see this. And I think that's a perfect example of what makes the NWA a little bit different. You know, La Rosa Negra was, was a wrestler that was recommended to us for years. And it just never clicked. And then the opportunity finally came. She came in, was in a match actually against Taya and got injured. It was just an accident. I uh, had to go to the hospital, um, you know, was, was, was out for a little while. There's some kind of rib stomach thing. It was, it was a bad spot. It just was just some bad spot went wrong. And, you know, literally came to me the next day, you know, holding her rib saying I can go. And the reason she's saying she can go is because she's afraid she's going to lose a spot that she's been waiting a chance for for years. I said, don't worry, I got you. We brought her back. As soon as I got to see her wrestle a full match in person against some of our talent, I knew right away I wanted to give her a title opportunity. And so we lined that up. And then when I actually went to her and I said, okay, you know, I want, to, I want you to do this. Are you, are you cool with this? She started crying and she said, are you, you mean for like the tag titles? And I said, no, you're going to wrestle Camille for the, for the world title. And, and, and that's what I'm saying is like, the ability for a talent to come in and make their name really quickly in the NWA, I think that's exciting. So Camille is a big game player. Camille's best matches are always against uh, an opponent who's ready to go at a top level in Rosenegger's experience. I think this is a match to really watch out for. 
I'd also watch out for uh, Kerry Morton versus Joe Alonzo. Um, Joe Alonzo so definitely an up and coming uh, talent. Um, and uh, he's one of those guys where it's like, you know, on first blush, you think like, okay, he's like a lot of guys out there. He's a cruiserweight. You know, there's a lot of guys kind of doing similar things. And sometimes it's hard to separate out cruiserweight out from the field. But a few people kind of pulled me aside and said, give this kid an opportunity. And when you see him work and when you see him talk and you see sort of the swagger that he has and the way he reminds you of other guys who have been successful in the business, I think he's one of those guys where you might look four or five years from now and his name will be on everybody's lips. So those are two matches I would point to. And of course, we have, you know, you know, uh, Tyrus versus Chris Adonis. Chris Adonis has been on me for years for a world title opportunity. Um, and so he's jacked up. Uh, you know, I said, if you weren't out there running your mouth trying to get on the Royal Rumble every five seconds, I'd be happy to give you a, a title <laughs> opportunity. Uh, that's our little inside joke. But I love Chris and I'm excited for him because, you know, there's a guy that was pushed out of the WWE system, basically was told, OK, you know, your best days are behind you. And he's rebuilt himself on the independent scene as a top tier contender. And so I think that's where I look at matchups like that. It's like, it's not just the matchup on paper, like Tyra is six, seven, 380 pounds versus master is probably a good three, 320, you know, still jacked out of his mind and, and both of them being veterans, but it's, it's, can they raise to that other level where people who doubt what they can do in the big game moments, can they show that they belong there? And that's what takes me back to an ECW when you would see an RVD versus a Jerry Lynn. And you would watch them in a show elevate to another level. And that's how people make their names. Because get, people get this kind of thing like, oh, I'm not a fan. Or they want to they want to bring in other things like in, in, with Tyrus, like bring in politics, right? I look at it as a promoter is I'm going to put these two guys in a spot. Can they elevate? And by elevating themselves, can they elevate the NWA and quiet the discussion that they don't quote unquote belong there. And that's how you make your oats in the, in the professional wrestling business as a booker, as a promoter and for the talent. Very cool. Uh, I know we're, we're running out of time here. I'm excited for this. I wanted to ask you about my birthday. You're, and you, you guys I know. are keeping me for my birthday celebration. I know. What, what are you doing? What are you, today? Yeah. What are you doing for your birthday? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I don't want to say I'm old, but I'm 56 and, uh, so a, a nice birthday for me. Uh, we do have a, a fancy dinner plan, but I'm just going to take my kids shopping and we'll just go. My kids love to go antique shopping with me. So we'll probably go over the border to Wisconsin. There's actually a place called Wisconsin. I don't know if you've ever been there. And uh, <laughs> people actually live up there. I can't believe it. And they, they make cheese. <laughs> and uh, so we'll go up there and do some shopping and then a fancy dinner later. But thank you for it. asking. I love it. That's, that's I, awesome. I love it. Uh, you know, it, it, it's uh, this is this is this was great. I had a great time talking to you about yep. this. I know we're out of time. It's your birthday. Uh, for more information, obviously, you can get get it in our notes here. Uh, and and talk before we wrap up. I uh, talk to me about the Highland Park Community Fund and uh, how the proceeds are going and and what they've been doing. Sure. Well, quick story. So when I bought the NWA five years ago, you know, I used to work in an indie promotion here. And of course, you'd think it'd be a no brainer. I buy the NWA, I bring the NWA back to Chicago for the first time in a while. And I just haven't. It just hasn't lined up. Last July 4th, this community I live in, Highland Park, Illinois, there was a mass shooting. Uh, I'm sure everybody heard about it. You know, I think this person fired 83 or 86 rounds into a crowd of 3000 people in a 4th of July parade. Some of my friends, some people work next door to my business. I have a tea house here. Uh, people shot. I mean, it's just total, total, crazy, awful, horrible stories. So last year we did a charity concert, raised a bunch of money for the community fund, which is a 30 plus year charity, which helped give money to some of the victims and their families because people were very aggrieved, of course, by what happened. And there, there's a long tail to that. It's not just physical injuries. There's mental health issues and other issues, including people losing jobs and stuff like that. So, um, we're doing a VIP event on April 6th. Uh, Tyrus, of course, has a book out, which is a bestseller. Medusa just put out a book. So we're doing a co-book signing at my tea house, Madame Zuzu's, on April 6th. So if anybody wants to come to that, nwatix.com. And then uh, and then proceeds from that event are going to go to the community fund because we want to continue to support that. Love it. Love it. Wonderful stuff. Billy, happy birthday. Thank you for coming Thank on. You. Enjoy the birthday. And, and that wraps it up, guys. <laughs>